Okay, so welcome to everybody. First of all, I would like to apologize on behalf of Carmen Garcia, who was unable to inaugurate this, this new series of, of, seminar, of seminars because she was having another, another uh, commitment. So this new series of seminars is organized by the Spanish Network on the LEC. As I said, it, was, it, has, it is coordinated by, by Carmen Garcia. The network started in 2008 and involves more than 150 uh, participants. Um, among other activities, the network is organizing the, the annual meeting. Uh, the annual meeting where we met uh, all together. Unfortunately, um, because of the pandemic restrictions, we cannot uh, anymore meet face-to-face. Uh, uh, so the uh, network will organize this new series of seminars with the idea that when the restrictions due to the pandemic will, will finish, then we can, uh, the speakers will go around the different institutes participated in, in, in the network. So today is a great pleasure to have Enma Torro, Pastor, who is going to talk about long-lived particles at the LAC experiments for the run three. Enma did his, uh, her PhD at the University of, of Valencia at, at IFI, and she had been working mostly in, in Atlas, and indeed she was a convener of, uh, of the SOTICs within, within this collaboration. So uh, she has also been working at the University of uh, of Washington in Seattle, and of course, for a long time at uh, CERN in Geneva. Uh, she's a few, uh, she incorporated, she came back to, to, to IFIC, to Valencia, with one of the positions of the excellence program of uh, Unilateral Valenciana, that is aimed at bringing back uh, the talent that is abroad to our, uh, our institute. So, uh, the floor is yours, Enma, and when you want, you can start with your uh, talk. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to share my slides. Okay, I, I hope you can see them well. Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to, to open this series of seminars and for giving me the opportunity to bring the long-lived particle world to such a broad audience, which is a pleasure. So as Herman said, uh, this seminar is, uh, it's, well, I, I planned it to cover, first of all, where we are in the search for long-lived particles at the LHC. And then looking at the future, what is what we can expect for, for run three and also a bit on the high luminosity phase. So first of all, when we start thinking about searching for new physics, we have to consider where we have to look or where we want to look. And the first um, uh, un quick answer is most of the times looking for, um, for models that break new particles that in most cases are prom promptly decaying. And, but in, in fact, there are many, many theory uh, scenarios where these new particles can be long lived. And here's a sketch uh, done by David Curtin, where you can see a summary of many of these scenarios where we have standard theories uh, going from lots of SUSY scenarios, uh, many uh, models involving dark matter, biogenesis, or neutrino masses like uh, right handed neutrinos. And in all this, there's some scenario where the new particles predicted by these theories uh, can be long-lived. So then, uh, yeah, uh, when we start uh, searching for these particles uh, in, in the LHC experiments, we have to consider that new particles can be either promptly decaying and we have a lot of, well, the, the message here was going to be that this has not to be a particular phase space or marginal residual phase space on any of these models, but long-lived particles are actually very common in the standard model already. So we have to consider all possibilities. So we 
when we think about new particles, we can we have to consider that they can be from 3 decaying, like uh, these ones in the standard model. Um, and these have these are actually uh, being very actively searched for in the LHC experiments. They can also be stable or detector stable, meaning that they can either be completely stable or decay outside the detector. And they, if these are generated together with some standard model activity, then we can use that activity to, get, to, to get the missing uh, energy uh, in the detector from the LLP. We can, there's also a lot of uh, searches in this direction, but then there's this intermediate range where the particle, the long leaf particle decays inside the detector. And for these ones, we have to make sure that we are actually looking for all possibilities. And for this, we need specific searches uh, for different signatures and new ideas are always uh, welcome. So then we want to look for long leaf particles, then how can we do that? And there are several uh, factors that we have to take into account. The first one would be, what is it more probable that I can find the LLPDK? And that depends on the lifetime of the long leaf particles that we are considering. And in these two sketches by Heather Russell, um, I'm trying to, to, to give you an idea on how this can change the signature that we can we want to look for. So for relatively long uh, lifetimes, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we'll have some of the LPS decaying in the innermost part of the detector. If the calorimeter is large, we'll have a large part of them decaying in the calorimeter, some of them in the immune system, which is the outermost uh, part, and just a few of them decaying outside the detector. But if we go to higher lifetimes, then we'll have just a few of them decaying in the tracker, some of them decaying in the calorimeters, a large portion of them decaying in the immune system, and for all these, we can develop strategies to look for them in ATLAS, CMS, or LHCB. But then we'll have many of them decaying actually outside the detector. And unless we can look for them with missing ET, we will be completely blind to this one. So this requires really a dramatic difference in the search strategy. Another thing we have to take into account when looking for long leaf particles is just nature, whether it's charged and then they will leave unconventional tracks uh, with different uh, DDX. Uh, compared to standard tracks, both if they can, this can be both in the inner detector, but also in the immune system if, if, the, if the particle is long lived enough. Or if they are neutral, then they will leave signatures like displaced vertices, displaced jets. Uh, if they are hadronic, this will be with many tracks, or if they are leptonic, we'll see single tracks or pairs of things. So depending on the nature, we will have to define a very specific signature that we will have to look for. And then we have these other three factors, which are also very important. The first one is object identification. Uh, the point here is that uh, the algorithms to reconstruct objects uh, at the LHC experiments normally, or they were designed assuming that the new particles or particles created at the, at the collision would be promptly decaying. So in this case, um, for long -lived particles, they are not very efficient. And so they have to be adapted. And in this regard, uh, lately, there's a lot of movement uh, in the machine learning techniques uh, that have been proven to be very useful for this. Another important point is the triggers. This is the first step in data taking. So if we don't trigger on, any, on an event, we will never be able to analyze it. And in cases where the LLP is generated with some standard model-like activity, we can use that activity to trigger on the event, and we can keep it and then analyze it uh, offline. But in cases where the LLP comes uh, alone or just with other uh, LLPs, not in association with any standard model activity, then we need a dedicated trigger uh, that is able to catch it and, and, and keep the event. And for this, we have several already uh, design triggers in, in both in, in the three experiments and trying to, to spot different signatures. And the last point is the background rejection. So in these searches, we have to consider background sources that in standard prompt searches um, are very easy to reject, but here we cannot reject, the, reject them so easily because we will also be rejecting a signal. 
And so we have to take into account things like material interactions, uh, things like beam halo muons, which are muons produced by interactions with the protons with um, the collimators in the LHC. And these muons travel parallel to the beam pipe and can create energy deposits that can be reconstructed as lambda particles and cosmic muons. So um, in general, there are not very good simulations for this. And so most of, or if not all these searches are rely on data-driven estimation methods. So in the next slide, I'm going to summarize the latest results in ADLAS, CMS, and LHCB with full run two data, uh, searching for long-leaf particles, just to give you an idea of the kind of analysis that we are talking about. So the first one that I'm uh, showing here is the search for disappearing tracks. So here we're considering a long leaf particle, which in this case is the neutral, the tartino, which decays to a neutralino and a soft pion. So what we see in the detector is uh, a track that starts at the interaction point. It lives for a while, and it leaves some hits in the innermost uh, layers of the pixel. And at some point it decays to the neutralino, so it stops uh, leaving uh, hits in the detector and the soft pion, which is too soft to be reconstructed. So what we see is a track that suddenly disappears. Uh, with no other information in the layer in the other layers uh, of the pixel or in the calorimeter. Atlas and CMS both have uh, searches for this uh, model um, with pretty similar strategies. And recently there have been some improvements uh, in the background rejection just uh, by adding further quality criteria to the to the track that we are selecting as a disappearing track. And here uh, you can compare the reads uh, in Atlas and CMS. Is there a comment or question? Okay, sorry, I thought I heard something. Yeah, so as, as I was saying, the read is quite similar. Atlas is slightly better at lower masses and CMS is able to read uh, slightly longer lifetimes. And in total, they are able to cover since that lifetimes from tens of picoseconds to hundreds of picoseconds. That was for charged long leaf particles. Now we can also consider uh, neutral long leaf particles. And in this case, CMS has a search looking for displaced vertices, which happen uh, within the LHC beam pipe. So these are the ones covering the shorter lifetime uh, ranges in all the ones that I'm going to, to show for Atlas and CMS. So here, the long leaf particle is either a neutralino or a gravitino that decays to three quarks. And because they are long lived, uh, they can give rise to, to a displaced vertex. So what this um, search does is to look for pairs of displaced vertices. And then uh, it uses variables like the distance between these two to be able to separate signal from, from uh, background. You can see here that this is a very good discriminating uh, variable where we see very small background compared to the expected signal for this variable. Um, yeah, so there was also a pretty uh, big improvement in this result uh, using a novel technique to suppress more background and to reduce significantly the, the, the background. And, and right now I think these are the most stringent um, limits in, in Atlas and CMS for, for this range of lifetimes that goes from the order of millimeter to tens of millimeters. Atlas also has some searches for displaced vertices, and this is an example of one of them. So here the, the model considered is uh, a Higgs that is produced in association with a Z boson that decays electronically. And they use these leptons, which are prompt uh, as a trigger. And then the Higgs decay to two scalars that can be long-lived and they will eventually decay to pairs of PV bar. So this, uh, this search, what, does is, what it does is uh, it looks for what they call uh, displaced jets, which have um, low, low density of tracks um, associated with the primary vertex. And then within, within those tracks, and also using large radius tracking, which is a special way of reconstructing tracks um, with, less con less, uh, uh, with softer conditions for the tracks and it allows for larger uh, impact parameter tracks. So with a combination of these large radius tracking and the standard tracks, 
they are able to reconstruct displaced vertices. And so then in the end, they match the displaced vertex to what they had to find before as a displaced set. And they look for pairs of these. Because they look for pairs of these, they are able to reject all background actually. And, and in the end, this is a zero background analysis. And in this search, they, they use uh, variables like this one, uh, where you can see the number of tracks associated to, to the displaced vertex. And you can see that in data, because they are normally not real vertices, but something generated with random tracks, crossings, or, or in, in interaction with the material and so on, you only expect a couple of tracks per vertex, but in signal, you expect many more. And um, yeah, and this, this search is able to cover a lifetime range uh, of, of the order of tens of uh, millimeters that had never been tested in Atlas before. So this is a very fresh new result. There's a similar one in CMS, uh, also looking for, so the model is basically the same, but without the associated Z boson. And the good thing here is that they have a trigger that is able to, to reconstruct displaced tracks at the HNT. And this is very useful because uh, it increases quite a lot the efficiency of the, of the analysis. Um, so yeah, what they do is to, again, look for pairs of jets, then using the tracks in these sets, both the standard tracks and displaced tracks, they are able to reconstruct a secondary vertex, which has to be matched to at least one of these sets. And then at the, at the event level, they use a, a multivariate analysis to discriminate at the event level the events containing these things uh, from the Q, huge QCD background, which is the dominant source. So because they have an increased efficiency thanks to this trigger, they are able to set more stringent bounds in this range. And you can compare this one um, here. It's about an order of magnitude better than the one in, in Atlas. In Atlas, we, they also have uh, this search for displaced leptons, which is also a new search that I had, I think it's the first time that it's, it's been done in Atlas. So in this case, uh, we look for a long-lived um, lepton that decays into, well, a lepton here that decays into a lepton and a gravitino. So what we see really is this displaced lepton and this other displaced lepton, because these two are uh, independent. We can have the three combination of flavors, either two electrons, two muons, or one, one of each. Um, and yeah, because they are not uh, generated from the same particle, they don't come from the same long leaf particle, they do not require them the two displaced leptons to come from the same vertex. Um, here, they also use this large radius tracking to reconstruct the, the displaced tracks. And here you can see an example on how the efficiency of the reconstruction for these muons with large input parameter increases from the black uh, dots, which is the standard tracking, uh, as when we include large radius tracking, this efficiency increases by a lot. And thanks to this, they are able to set limits for relatively high uh, masses of the of the lepton, up to 800 GeV for order of one, uh, 0 0.1 nanoseconds, but uh, up to 10 nanoseconds for, for uh, lower masses of the lepton. At the LCD, there's also a great effort to look for long leaf particles. And I'm showing two examples here. So this one is a low mass uh, demuon resonance. So we have these X bosons that decay to mu plus uh, mu minus. Um, they have the two options, either from decays of these bosons or displaced um, long-lived uh, case, where they consider lifetimes of about uh, one picosecond. And the nice thing here is that they are able to, to read very low masses of these bosons, which are, I think, very hard to read in, in the other experiments. They also look for vertices made of electron muon, and they consider several scenarios for this. You can have a neutralino decaying breaking RPV, R parity, or a decay from an HNL, which is uh, long lived. Um, they consider several production modes. And, and in this range of, of lifetimes, they are able to set limits uh, for masses up to 50 uh, GeV. Also a nice feature of this is that LHCB is able to cover 
more forward regions than Atlas and CMS. So it's in a way it's complementary to the Atlas and CMS searches. And the last example that I want to show is this stop particles um, analysis in Atlas, which is in a way different from the ones that I showed before, because it doesn't involve uh, tracking or anything like that. So in this case, what we have is a, a NAR hadron uh, that is a long lift. It is created when the two beams in the LHC collide. Uh, we call that paired bands crossings. Uh, and paired band crossings uh, are surrounded by empty band crossings where we don't have any protons. So what happens is uh, when the collision happens in the paired band crossing, the, the R hadron is created, it travels for a bit, it interacts with the detector and it can get stopped there. After some time, it will decay. And what the analysis does is to look for these decays during empty band crossings, which means this is time where there's no collision in, at the LHC. And so uh, this is a very clean environment with a very small contamination from standard model uh, backgrounds. Um, this was quite a challenging analysis because they implied many uh, technicalities. So for one thing, they had to redesign uh, the signal modeling for this one. Uh, also for the background uh, reconstruction, they need special configuration to be able, for example, to reconstruct cosmics coming from the top of the detector to the bottom. So, it, and then all backgrounds they have is, uh, they are non-collision. So cosmic, basically cosmics, but also beam induced and covering background. So with all this, uh, yeah, they unfortunately didn't see any signal. Uh, and EXS, and, and they are able to set limits uh, for gluinos of the order of one TeV. And the amazing thing here is that they are able to cover a range of lifetimes that goes from 10 nanoseconds to about a year in lifetime, which is quite impressive. So with this, I wanted to give you a bit of the, the idea that uh, we can do a lot of searches in different parts of the detector and all of them can be com complementary to each other and each of them can cover a different uh, lifetime range and we can then combine them to expand the lifetime coverage that we have in total. So I have two examples here. One is for this model that I already presented before. Um, so this is the Higgs-like particle decay into two scalars that can be long-lived and then will eventually decay to fermions. There's a prompt search in Atlas looking for this, and it was pre-interpreted for long-lived uh, scenarios, not so with relatively short lifetimes. Uh, we got this uh, this exclusion. Then we have the VH to four B analysis that I that I just showed uh, before, which is uh, pretty new in Atlas, and it covers this intermediate range of lifetimes. And then we have these other two analyses looking for displaced jets in the calorimeter and in the muon system, which cover much longer lifetimes. So the combination of three uh, cover a very wide range. Similar situation in CMS, we have uh, the two analyses that I showed uh, before, the one with displaced jets and the one with displaced vertices in the beam pipe cover uh, together uh, the, the lower part of the lifetime uh, range. And then there's another analysis looking for delayed jets in the calorimeter, which is able to cover uh, slightly higher ranges of the lifetime. So now looking at the future, uh, run three and the high luminosity phase will come with a lot more luminosity, but also with upgraded detectors. And this is a good opportunity to think what can we do to make the best use of this data. And in this regard, there's many, many plans and ideas uh, for things that we can do. So one thing that is not specific to the future, but is something we can always do, but it helps to, in, to, to uh, amplify the results we have is for interpretation. So understanding the background is one of the biggest part of any analysis. It takes a lot of time uh, to understand the data we have. And indeed, every search is defined based on a few benchmark theory models, but there can be many models other than these that can lead to similar signatures. So the idea is let's use the published results we have after doing all this work to understand the backgrounds 
and reinterpret them in these other models. So we can also set limits in, in models that were not used actually in the analysis, but can be sensitive to it. So an, an example is again, uh, this, uh, this model here. Uh, the original search for this brain interpretation was a search for pairs of displaced jets in the calorimeter. And then it was reinterpreted in terms of this SUSY model, uh, still SUSY, in biogenesis, and in this uh, dark model, uh, for including dark photons. So the three of them were originally searched for uh, looking for Ob displays objects in the immune system. Uh, these two looked for vertices in the immune system, and the last one looked for pairs of very collimated neurons also in the immune system. So here you can see in the yellow green line is the original result for the specific uh, search done for, for this model. And then the blue purple line is the reinterpretation we did uh, in, the in the calorimeter search. And you can see that in, in the three cases, you can extend the coverage in lifetime from the original search to slightly lower lifetimes, um, which is great. But we can, besides reinterpreting one displaced, so one search for long lived particles into another search for long lived particles, we can also reinterpret searches that were originally defined for prompt objects. Uh, into scenarios with slightly long list particles. And, and both CMS and Atlas have been doing this uh, for some time. And we have several results where we have this, uh, the prompt analysis result that has later been interpreted and able to set limits for some uh, decay lengths. Another thing we can do to improve our results uh, looking at the future is um, trying to improve the object identification. This is one of the key parts of every analysis looking for displaced objects. And it's a very, a very challenging part. So lately, as I said before, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in, in using machine learning techniques for the identification of long-lived particles. And uh, CMS recently published this very nice paper showing how using a deep neural network uh, can be very useful to identify displaced jets. So what they do is um, they take all the information they have along the, the detector when they reconstruct the jet, they put it into the neural net um, in the different steps of the reconstruction. And with that, they are able to separate um, a real displaced jet. In this case, it's a... Um, a gluino decaying to two quarts and a neutralino, then the quarts, um, well, the, 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 the gluino is, is uh, long lived, and then the quarks um, give rise to displaced jets. So, yeah, with this method, they were able to separate very nicely displaced jets from background. And here in this plot, you can see the effect that that improvement had in, in the final limits again. So, here the dashed line corresponds to the original search. And then the purple line here would be the improvement of the new limit um, when this technique is applied. And this is for two different uh, scenarios in, in the neutralino gluino model. Another thing we have to think about is new triggers. So yeah, trigger is the first, the first filter we have in data. And if we discard <clears throat> a new process at trigger level, then we will never be able to discover it. So we have to be care very careful with this and make sure that we are triggering in every possibility for new physics. So the detectors are being upgraded for run three and for high luminosity. And this uh, is an opportunity to create new, new triggers and, and implement new ideas. So the idea of LHCB for, uh, for run three is to not uh, not include the level zero trigger, but include but uh, have all the triggering done at high level trigger. With this, uh, they are able to increase the storage by quite a lot, and and this is going to gain them a factor of two in the hadronic channels. In Atlas and CMS, we cannot do that, so we have to think a bit more and um, ways to improve the triggers that we use for these um, events. So we already have many dedicated triggers. Uh, for long wave particles, and this gets the ones in red. Uh, so the, the, the signatures in red are ones that have specific triggers dedicated to them. 
So there's already been quite a lot of work done in this regard, but now there's uh, more than we can do. So we can include uh, large radius tracking at trigger level, and we can also try to uh, cover more difficult play spaces, like uh, places where we have low PTs, and then um, the trigger thresholds are too low for them to, 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 to be able to be selected. So many of these uh, require new approaches and, and a lot of imagination, but there's a lot of work ongoing in this direction. An example on how a new trigger can help um, um, an analysis is this one that I'm showing in the search for very collimated muons, displaced collimated muons. So we have this dark matter model where we have dark photons, which are very light. And because they are very light, uh, they are very boosted. And then the decay products, which in this case are muons, are very, very collimated. You can see here a plot on the distance, the, the distance in phi between these two muons, which can be really tight. So then the problem is that the trigger in run two didn't have the, enough granularity to be able to separate these muons uh, to, to identify the, the two of them. Um, and the analysis was relying on a single muon uh, trigger with thresholds which are very high. Um, for this kind of analysis, which looks for relatively soft particles. So the idea here was to use uh, the high luminosity configuration where at, at level zero, uh, you can look for heat patterns in the, in the muon system. And with this, look for two separate muons that are in the same region of interest. And with this, uh, be able to, to select two different muons, which are very close by already um, at trigger level. And here in the plot, you can see uh, the prospects on how we uh, expect to improve this result. This is a relative, not, not very new result. So this is a 36 uh, inverse front of run from, from run two. This analysis is ongoing for full run two and will come soon. Um, but for now, this is the public and uh, uh, public plot uh, we have. And then this is the prospects uh, for run three and for high Lumi, which includes already the new trigger uh, for this process, uh, for this um, prospect. And you can comparing the dark green here to, to these ones, you can see that, um, yeah, the, the, the coverage is going to be extended by quite a lot. So CMS did a similar exercise uh, in a very in a similar uh, model. Um, so here, one of the big changes is that they will use uh, this uh, and uh, more dedicated algorithm to reconstruct displaced muons, um, which is able to reduce a lot the background, and, and thanks to that, uh, the reach is going to be increased also by quite a lot. Okay, so that's regarding the, the main experiments at the LHC, but there's also uh, the possibility of extending that uh, even further. So the LHC uh, current experiments, <laughs> the main experiments at La CMS and LHCB are able to cover a range in, in the LLP masses and also a range in the lifetime. But there's also, and, and we have all these uh, searches that I talked about trying to, to cover that. But in the end, these searches are limited by a number of factors. So we have the trigger constraints we talked about. We have lots of background from the collision. And in the end, they are limited by the detector size. So the idea here is let's try to increase the, the reach of the LHC by adding new detectors, which can cover these parts that, that the current analysis, the current experiments cannot cover. And I took this uh, sketch, the schematics from, from the Codex V letter of intent, which I thought was quite nice, uh, where you can uh, separate these new ideas into forward detectors. Uh, th so these are experiments that will be placed close to the beam pipe, so in the forward direction of the main, main experiment. So the LP would be created at the collision in the main experiment, and then um, it will travel for a while, and in the forward direction, we will have an experiment trying to, to catch them. I, I included two uh, examples of this kind. So we have SHIP, which will be a beam dump experiment at the SPS. It will need a new beam line, um, which will have to be constructed. Both of these are targeting very weakly interacting uh, long leaf particles, and this one in particular is aiming at 2025. Then phaser, uh, also 
a forward experiment. This will this will be in the forward direction um, in the Atlas experiment. So the, the LP will be created in Atlas. We'll travel for a while, and and at some point it will encounter the phase of experiment. It's also targeting light and weakly interacting interacting uh, particles. And this one was a very incredible case, where the letter of intent was submitted in 2018. The next year it was approved, and the next year it was already starting the, the installation. And this one is expected to be taking data for one free. There's also an idea to try to increase the, the sensitivity for the high Lumi with a phaser to um, version. And the other kind of experiments that we can uh, place next to, to the main uh, experiments are in the transfer di uh, direction. So some examples would be code XP. Uh, this one uh, is to be placed in the LHCB cavern. So this would be the LHCB experiment. Um, here is one of the walls that are going to be used as shielding. And this is the, the space that was used by the CPU, the trigger CPUs um, in, in LHCB that now will be substituted for this code XP analysis um, experiment. The original idea is to have a, a detector which is 10 times 10 times 10 uh, meters in, in volume with six layers of RPC that are going to be acting as tracking. Uh, this will be for high luminosity, but in the meantime, they are planning to construct, to construct a demonstrator uh, smaller in size, but that will be taking data the, during round three and that can be used uh, to check the backgrounds and the technology for the final detector. A similar idea, uh, just as extending one of the main experiments a bit further, is Anubis, which is targeting also uh, long leaf particles that would be created uh, in Atlas. Um, and the idea is to instrument the elevator shaft, uh, one of the elevator shaft in, in Atlas, uh, with layers of RPCs. Um, and yeah, so here the idea is that they can combine the information they get from the collision in Atlas together with these um, additional detectors to, to be able to um, find a bit more out, find out a bit more about the, the event that created the potential LP. Another case is Matusla, uh, which is uh, planned to be placed on the surface about, above CMS. So this would be the interacting point of CMS, just um, 80 meters underground. The LP will be created in the collision at, the, at CMS. It will travel for a while. And then the Atlas detector has uh, quite a large decay volume where the LP would decay. And then a uh, number of layers that uh, layers of scintillators that will act as tracking um, to be able to, to spot and to identify the LP decay. Um, for this one, there was a test stand that was placed uh, up in the surface above Atlas in 2018, and it took data uh, that was analyzed and confirmed the background hypothesis that um, have been taken into account for the letter of intent of Matusla. And then we have Medal, which is the one that has been there for the longest time. It already has many results published. This one is located in the LHCB cavern, um, in the walls around the detector, uh, and it's targeting highly ionizing particles and magnetic monopoles and massive charged particles. So it's composed of um, two sets of different uh, technology. One would be magnetic monopole traps and also nuclear track detectors. Um, and this one's um, when uh, highly in ionizing particle crosses through them. It leaves a, a small damage in the material that you can later um, scrutinize and, and try to see uh, what they are. So for the first time, uh, Medal has uh, published very recently um, a search for dions. Uh, they also have the most stringent, without doubt, uh, limits on, on monopoles uh, masses. You can compare here the reads of Atlas uh, at 8 TeV. The 13 TeV uh, analyses are ongoing, but then Medal really has much more uh, efficiency for this kind of, of particles. Um, 
they are also having they also have some plans for the future they are planning to build map which will will be targeting milli charged particles and MAL, which is uh, targeting very long lived particles, which are charged. And they also have plans to study the old beam pipe uh, from run one uh, from CMS and search for the presence of monopoles there. And all these experiments have some complement complementarity uh, between them. So, for example, here, comparing the, the reads um, in a model looking for dark photons. Um, <clears throat> so in green here and in purple here, we can see the read of the Atlas 2 TV analysis, which is looking for the space vertices in the neon system, and is the one with the largest um, lifetime coverage in Atlas. If we compare that, for example, to Code HP, we, we see that Code HP is able to read larger lifetimes, and then if we also compare it to Matusla, Matusla is also um, extending the coverage by quite a lot. We can also look at things like uh, heavy neutral leptons. And here there's uh, many analysis that can co many experiments that uh, can co contribute. SHIP is probably the one with the highest uh, coverage. Also, Mathusla uh, can extend a bit. And then we have uh, Code XV and Phaser also expanding a little bit more the coverage. And if you're curious about how to compare all these experiments, you can uh, have a look at this paper here, which has lots of details about all these analysis, all these experiments, and comparing the, the coverage in lifetimes that they have. So I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, just to conclude, the we have to, to take in mind that uh, the LLPs might be the key for finding new physics. And it's very nice to see that the interest in long lived particles is, is increasing. This is a, a, a plot that our colleague in Atlas being um, prepared, <clears throat> just searching for papers uh, having long lived in the abstract. And you can see that the number of them is increasing uh, recently. So there's a great effort in the LHC experiment uh, trying to find these particles. That is, um, uh, a summary of the results for searches for long lived particles in CMS here and in Atlas here, you see that there's a large number of searches covering a wide uh, range in lifetimes, but it's still not even close to the effort that we have in prompt searches. Um, again, this is the number of searches we have in CMS, uh, prompt searches, and the ones in Atlas. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of development uh, and new tools and strategies to improve the identification of long lived particles. And in fact, we are pushing the detector to do things that they were not uh, originally designed to do. And now we have run free and the high luminosity phase offering a great opportunity to, to implement new ideas and to bring more unconventional signatures to be explored. <clears throat> the LLP community is also growing. We have now this LHC LLP working group. And we have this uh, white paper that was published last year and that collects everything that has been done so far yeah, in the LHC experiments regarding long lived particles, plans for the current experiments, plans for the future, and, and new ideas. I think it's very interesting if you're interested. And we also have this uh, large range of different uh, new experiments proposed to search for long lived particles. Many of them are very young collaborations, and in general, they are happy to welcome new people. So um, if you're looking for something new, interesting to do, just consider that there's, a, there's an interesting topic here yeah, that is growing a lot. And yeah, I think that's everything that I have. Thanks for listening. OK, thank you very much, Enma for this comprehensive presentation of the long lived world. <laughs> and now we have some time for questions. Just switch on your microphone and your video to, to see some, some, some face. Marie Jose. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, so th thank you for this very nice talk. I have a question. I was in particular interested in the results you showed on the new triggers uh, for the high LUMI LAC. So of course, uh, when we were thinking on this upgrade of the experiment, the as the current detectors, the detection of long leaf particles was not, I mean, the detectors were not designed for that, but it's very, nice that you found some examples where the detectors are are better for the high lumi upgrade than the current one so is this just the example or are there many more cases where an improvement is expected with the new detectors there's a lot of work ongoing just nothing public enough so i could share it here but there's a lot of plans and I see Arancha is connected, so maybe she can give you a more of an up, a more updated um, idea. But I can tell you that there's many, many ideas. There's, for example, one which is, I think, one of the most is going to have the large impact for sure, which is including large radius tracking uh, at trigger level. That's going to, to have a big impact um, in every search that looks for displaced tracks and displaced vertices, for sure. But there's many other, so there's um, improvements also regarding this model. There are, I think, one more uh, for this collimated muons. I don't know, there, there are several, um, many more ideas. There's also the idea of using trigger level analysis, which uh, um, allows you to save a lot more events because the size of the events is, is smaller. You don't keep all the information of the event, just part of it the one that you think is interesting for your analysis. And with that, you can lower the thresholds uh, of the objects that you use for triggering. That's also uh, something that is being considered that can help for long leaf particle searches. So yeah, there's many, many other examples where the trigger is going to be in, improved for either RAN3 or the high LUMI. Yeah, I was just thinking on the detector upgrade itself. So for the high LUMI phase, if, uh... As you mentioned. Okay, thanks. <laughs> of course, you cannot share anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I selected this one because it's the only one with a publication, actually. <laughs> okay, Pablo, go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. So, yeah, uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I think it was really great. Um, unfortunately, I had to leave for, for five minutes while you were talking, and, and I, I have a question that I don't know if you covered or, or didn't cover. It's related the the new timing detectors that are going to be built in, in CMS and Atlas, for example, for the upgrade, and, and the fact that um, the thesis cases that these uh, detectors are presenting are in, in many cases is uh, I mean long long leaf physics because you know by measuring the delay of the particles this is an interesting quantity also by the way for the for the trigger so the question is uh, whether you cover this in your presentation or, or whether you know something about this uh, the prospects for example for for this experiment yeah I didn't explicitly cover it again because I didn't find anything uh, which is public yet, but I know mm -hmm. there's a, there are ideas uh, to use this as, as a detector for long leaf particles. As you said, um, long leaf particles can, can, can make use of this either because they are slowly moving or either because the path they follow mm -hmm. is not the same as something that comes directly from the IP. So timing is a very good discriminator. And yes, uh, there's there's plans to use these um, high granularity timing detectors to, to 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 increase the reach of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 maybe um, uh, what is your feeling about uh, how useful this information could be? Uh, I mean, if you if you thought about this in. You mean timing? Yes, the timing. Yes. Timing can be really, <laughs> it's a key variable, I would say. Uh, it can be very important for this kind of, of uh, searches. For one thing, it's important already to discriminate backgrounds because you can have backgrounds like beam-induced, which has a very specific timing distribution. 
then the better timing you have, the better you're going to be at discriminating these ones. Also for cosmics, also for noise. But then for long-lived particles as well, um, if already if you compare with the current analysis we have, if you compare the timing you expect for QCD, for example, to the timing you expect for long-lived particles, you can already see a, a huge difference. So yeah, I think they, they, can, they can really make a, I don't know if it's a very big difference, but for sure they, they are going to be useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Further questions? Yes. Uh, you, you are Ivan? No. Okay, who are you? Redondo? Hi, uh, this is uh, Ignacio. Ignacio Redondo. Ignacio. Okay, go yes. ahead. Thanks. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm curious about the <clears throat> the Matusla apparatus. I don't know if you could say a little bit more about it and um, particular the, the 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 schedule and how 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 is it planned to be integrated with the with the underground detectors. So about the planning, um, this is planned for high luminosity. Now uh, we're working to to update the um, the expression of interest and the TDR. So it's there's a lot of work in progress about this, and we're defining finalizing defining the technology that we want to use. It will probably be scintillators for the most part, but then we're also adding an RPC layer will help to make this more of a cosmic uh, detector, which can also help in the cosmic ray physics. So technology is still being uh, studied and, and there's a lot of work to do there yet. And, and about how to combine this with CMS, this is something that has been discussed already, but it's, uh, I'm, right now I'm not completely sure what can be done and what cannot be done. Basically because of the timing, um, from the collision to where when the LLP reaches the Methuselah experiment. So um, the idea would be that, I, I don't know if this is what you were asking or not, but what I can tell you, it would be really interesting if we could use the LLP. The, uh, so when we reconstruct something in Methuselah, if we can then ask CMS, did you see something uh, special in that event, or can you give us information indeed, about that event? Uh, that's what uh, make it interesting, I guess. Exactly. So this is something that is still being discussed. If uh, if Mathusla can actually be used as a trigger to CMS, not... So if we see something interesting in Mathusla, can we ask CMS to store that event, or is it too late? And and the, the event is gone already from the buffer. That's something that is... To me, it's not completely clear yet, but it's in discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Another question? So, I have a question as a theorist. So, how can we theorists help in the search of long lived particles? How, which can be our contribution? That's a very good question. <laughs> so actually, there's a lot of contribution from, from theorists already. And in this white paper that I talked about uh, in the conclusions here, there's a large contribution from the theory community, basically telling us where there's still phase spaces or parameter spaces which have not been explored yet with uh, other models that you think might be interesting and cannot be covered with the current searches that are ongoing. And they are also contributing a lot on the design of these new experiments, like helping making all these nice plots uh, with um, what you expect to, to be covering needs of the, of the proposed experiments. And even um, when trying to determine the final design of the experiment which is the best configuration that we 
that we can uh, define so that the, the acceptance and the coverage in, in several different theory models is the maximum possible. So if you're interested, there's many places where, where the input from theories is crucial. And yeah, as I said, there's, uh, I think Jose Frita was here, was connected before. He's also- I, been, I am here. Yeah, <laughs> he's been contributing here a lot. So maybe he can, he can also comment on this. So I, I think that Emma gave a, a key answer here. I mean, uh, most of the time we need to say, look, this is not being covered and I have a great model that will fall, will he, will be exactly there and you should try to cover it. Sometimes things are impossible, right? I mean, we, there's a threshold for charge tracks at the LEC, we cannot go below it. Uh, and uh, also something else that this is happening to me, I don't know to others, is that uh, I am starting to get more in joint ventures with experimentalists. So writing Fino papers where I have some collaborators that are experimentalists, where we look at many different kinds of things. Of course, we cannot make use of internal information, but uh, I wrote at least, yeah, I mean, I think with every, with Atlas CMS and LACB, with each of them, I wrote a, a Fino paper with one of each experimentalist proposing new searches. Uh, so I think this, this also has an impact, right? Because it's not that uh, it's coming totally alone, but that you get also the experience. So this, this joint, venture, joint venture papers, uh, I think they, they, they can actually give a, an important push for the, for the program. Or if you find a model that, that can be tested with many different searches, which is something I also did, uh, then it's good because you can make these comparison plots and show that you, you really need an NLP program that covers as much um, lifetime and as much mass range as possible. So sometimes, for instance, in, in the very, uh, let's say, uh, older papers on these studies, they say, okay, let's take supersymmetry as a benchmark model, and then we look at some NLP in SUSI. But then it's not true that you essentially will cover the, the whole parameter space. So in some cases, SUSI is picky and tells you, I want to have a charge particle with 10 millimeters lifetime. That's it. I mean, it cannot be one meter. So it, it's also good if one can develop sort of more uh, theoretical frameworks that can have some, some theory inspiration behind it, where you can take many different searches for display vertices in the immune system, in the inner detector, one here and one there, uh, and, and clamp them together to, to show what you can do. So MSSM is usually good for this, but there are other models that I've been working on, for instance, where you, you uncover a different uh, perspective on how all these searches uh, come together and what is actually the, the coverage. So this is also something that can be done if you have a great model in mind. Okay, thank you very much. A last question. So if not, thanks again to Emma for this nice presentation. So and hope to see you again in the next uh, in the next talk. I mean, the idea is to have one talk uh, per month. We have uh, already collected uh, quite a lot of uh, proposals, but of course, uh, at any point you can make uh, an extra proposal for for this kind of talk, of of talks uh, within the within the network. And uh, that's all. Hope to see you again uh, in the next uh, in the next talks. Thanks for attending.